All right. Well, welcome everyone to the end of day two at Build. We appreciate you hanging with us for uh, two really, really long days. Uh, my name is Mark, this is Priya, uh, and we are here to talk to you about building an inclusive language feedback loop using Microsoft Graph and Cognitive Services. And this is gonna be a lot of live demo, not too much talking, um, and we recognize that we're the last thing between you and dinner or beer, although I guess this guy found a beer somewhere. Uh, you guys can go fight him for his beer. Um, but we'll, we'll move quickly through this. We'll be available for questions afterwards. All right, Philip K. Dick has this amazing quote about inclusive language. There exists for everyone a sentence, a series of words that has the power to destroy you. Another sentence exists, another series of words that could heal you. And the reality is, in today's day and age, uh, that inclusive language is a really important facet of being successful in the modern workplace. And it's not just because it's the right thing to do, it's because it really enables a better workplace. When you use inclusive language, you draw people in, they share their ideas, you result in better business decisions and better business outcomes. And so it's particularly important for us to use inclusive language. But it's hard, right? Like we, we inadvertently use exclusive language or non-inclusive language in, in various times and places. In fact, when I was putting this deck together, I've got a, a slide coming up in a couple of slides uh, that has a whole bunch of different emojis on it. And one of the emojis that I used was the rock and roll hand or the I love you sign. And somebody ironically pointed out to me in a private email thread that sometimes hand gestures are not interpreted the same across the world. And while that particular hand gesture doesn't appear to be uh, interpreted rudely anywhere, I did remove it and, and replace it with something else. But the point is that sometimes we just, we have these unconscious usages of language or emojis or what have you um, it, that result in bad outcomes. So today we're actually gonna build an application. We're gonna piece together a bunch of different stuff um, and we're gonna build an application that will tell us when we're not using inclusive language. So, of course, this being built, you might think that the promise is going to be entirely around graph, and I'm going to come sell you this amazing solution that is entirely 100% graph-powered. And in fact, we do make a lot of promises with graph, and we do have a ton of data and intelligence in graph, uh, but the reality is that, that it's missing some things. So we, we promise all these things about all your data is accessible, and today we're going to access data from Exchange. We promise that things are available for corporate and consumer users, and they are. We promise that you only have to use one API key, one uh, SDK, one set of documentation, and you do. But still, things are missing. And so we have gaps in graph, graph and, and graph is not really 100% of the picture. But this is okay, because this is you know, where you guys come in and where you guys can fill in that missing piece and add value by pairing Graph and its data and intelligence together with other sets of data and intelligence. And so um, we're going to supplement Graph to make one whole puzzle uh, by pairing the data from Microsoft Graph with cognitive services. Again, in your real life scenario, it might not be cognitive services that you turn to. You might turn to data on your own premises or your own intelligence services or somebody else's intelligence services. We're just combining these two technologies to show you how they might work together. So let's take a look at the kind of overall big picture of what it is that we're going to build in about 10 minutes here. Um, and, and we're gonna do this by laying out a, a series of different icons here. So this is Jim. Uh, Jim is fictional. He doesn't bear any resemblance to a real Jim, hopefully. Um, but Jim has an idea, and he wants to send an email to uh, one of his coworkers. So he goes ahead and drafts this particular email, sends it out. It doesn't matter how the email gets sent. It could be sent through Outlook. It could be sent through your iOS mail client. It could be sent through the web app. It doesn't really matter how it gets sent. Graph will notice that that email has been sent and it will allow you to take appropriate actions on it. One of the things that you can do with Graph is register webhook subscriptions so that upon certain events, like the sending of an email, Graph will reach out to your application and notify you that something has happened so you can take action. So in our case, uh, Graph is going to trigger a webhook. That webhook is registered to go land on an Azure function. And that Azure function is going to start taking apart that, that notification. So specifically, it will receive the ID of the email that was sent. It's going to turn around. It's going to go and ask Microsoft Graph for the body of that email. And it's going to take the body of the email and send it up to Cognitive Services for evaluation. 
So Cognitive Services has a bunch of services available uh, inside of it. One of the services is the Content Moderator service. And the Content Moderator service can be configured with custom term lists. So specifically, we'll be setting up a custom term list that will look for some non-inclusive language. It's going to be pretty trivial in our case. But you can imagine how you might build this out more or how you might use a different service like Lewis or something like that to get richer intelligence. So once Cognitive Services evaluates the, the text, if it's inclusive, awesome, right? Like this is a really good outcome, good job, Jim. If it's not inclusive, then what we're going to do is turn around, send a separate email back to Jim. Now I want to point out that this is a closed loop. The email comes from Jim to Jim, doesn't go to Jim's manager. It's not you know, available to the enterprise in any way, shape, or form. And this is a fictional scenario anyway. So, but, but you know, Privacy is important, and so this is a closed loop email. Um, hopefully, from that email, Jim is able to learn something and maybe use more inclusive language next time around, which, again, results in an awesome outcome. So this is, this is the overall picture of what it is that we're going to build. And so now we're going to just jump into live demos all the way through. I'm going to use my phone to make sure that we go through the right steps. Uh, and Priya here is going to walk us through things. So step number one is we need to go register an application with Microsoft Graph. Now, when you register an application with Microsoft Graph, there's a bunch of things that it's going to ask you for. The bare minimum that you need to supply is a name. So if Priya clicks on Add an App here, then she has to supply a name for the, for the application. And then she can just click Create after that, after that point. Now, when you create your application for this particular scenario, we need to request certain sets of permissions. Specifically, we need to request mail read write and mail send so that we can actually read that email and then also send another email in response. Um, we are going to request those as application permissions as opposed to delegated permissions. I'm going to zoom this in just a little bit. Whoa. I'm going to zoom it in a lot. I'm not going to zoom it. I'm just going to let you control it. Um, but we requested these as application permissions because the Azure function, which is what's retrieving that email and sending the email, is running without a user interactively logged in, right? It is running as an application, so we had to request application permissions. This also makes our scenario slightly more complicated because when you're running in that sort of mode and you don't have a user logged in, well, somebody has to consent to the application. The, the application can't just randomly run, right? So in this case, because there is no user logged in, an administrator has to consent to the application. We're we're going to skip that step because it's complicated and ugly, um, and uh, administrators generally know how to do that sort of thing anyway, but, but it is a good thing to kind of look up afterwards. And we'll be sharing fairly detailed instructions of how to step through this all the way through, and we'll make sure that that's, that's in there. Um, but we've, we've configured a localhost URL for this thing to call back to. It's not really going to be used. That's really only important for doing the admin consent, and we've set up the application permissions. So once we have our application configured, the next thing that we need to do is register cognitive services. And we'll hopefully not have a timeout here. Um, when you go to contentmoderator.cognitive.microsoft.com, you can actually kind of si sign up for a trial uh, subscription for, for the content moderator service specifically. This will allow you to kick the tires. If you're building a production app, obviously you want to sign up for a real subscription. And you know, cognitive services vary. They have differing pricing tiers. Some of them are free to run for a while. Some of them have initial costs. So just make sure you look at the pricing. Um, in this particular case, what we're using here is free to try out. Um, in Cognitive Services, there's, there's a couple basic things, again, that you have to give it. You have to give it a name. Tell it where you're going to be using it. Again, production application, you'd want the proximity to be close to where you actually are. Um, in our case, we don't care about any of that stuff. So we just filled in some dummy values. We're just going to go in and grab a couple values that we'll need later in the process. Specifically, we'll need the, the endpoint URL for the cognitive service. Um, that will be used to configure the, the list. And we'll also need the subscription key, which we're going to use to both configure the list as well as invoke the, the actual evaluation of our text. All right. So next, we need to actually set up the list management API. So we're going to jump over to Postman. And we've got a total of three API calls here that are going to all be HTTP API calls. All three of them will be posts. Um, they're all going to go, oh boy, this one I think you have to do control plus. Or, oh, good, perfect. Um, 
they're all going to go to that, that URL that we just saw. Um, the very first one is actually creating the list itself. So step number one is create a list. Step number two is add terms to the list. Step number three is update the index. So, so step number one, we just need to supply a name for the list. And so we've just got a, a post here that has application JSON. You can see that we've supplied a name for the list. When this HTTP call is sent, then we'll just get back a hopefully 201 created, and we get an ID for our list. In a real scenario, you'd need to use this, this ID for subsequent calls. We're just going to use the same list ID that we already have plugged into our thing. But, but you would need this list for subsequent API calls. So the second call is going out to create the terms uh, for non-inclusive language. Uh, and in this particular case, we're going to call the bulk update API. There are other ways to create terms, too, with your content moderator. Uh, but we're going to use the bulk update so we can pass in a bunch of terms at once. In this case, we're going to use guys and girls. Guys is reasonably obvious. Girls, one of my female friends, clued me in. Um, unless you're going to use boys, then girls is not a very um, appropriate term to use. Uh, so we're going to use these two terms. Again, you know, you'd want to build out something more realistic than this. But when we send this bulk update, again, we get a, a positive response, a successful response. And now our, our list has terms in it. And then the last thing that we need to do is actually go out and update that subscription. Or I'm sorry, update, update the index. This is just so that cognitive services can operate efficiently. So once we've executed uh, these three calls, we can move on to the next step, which is going out and creating the Azure Function app. I'm, for the sake of time, I'm going to assume that most people here have created an Azure Function app before. Uh, one of the more modern ways to do it is uh, to use Visual Studio to create a function app. If you have Visual Studio, you can just download the extension for uh, Azure Functions. This gives you the ability to debug locally and, and do all your testing locally before you actually push it up to Azure. Um, and it also has a handy dandy little right click publish type thing where you can push that thing up to Azure. The first time you do it, if you haven't published before, then it will give you the option to publish to a new function app and it will actually create the function app for you and not even require you to go into the Azure portal, which is pretty nice. Um, because we have published before, uh, we actually have a published target already configured. Um, and so we just have a couple NuGet dependencies uh, that we were using, and, and we pushed up from Visual Studio. And if time allows, we'll jump back and, and take a look at some of the key parts of this code in, in just a second here. So once we have the Azure Function app uh, configured, we, we do need to plug in some special stuff to the settings, uh, the client ID, the client secret that we got when we created the application, the cognitive services subscription key. Again, in a real world scenario, you'd want to protect your settings your, your secure settings better than putting them in a config file somewhere. Probably Azure Key Vault or something along those lines would be a better solution. Um, but, but then we can go ahead and actually publish that Azure function. Again, we've already done that in this particular case. One thing that we need to do when we publish the Azure function is actually grab the function URL once it has been published. This, as far as I know, you do have to jump into the Azure portal for. And so uh, she's loaded up the Azure function here. She clicked on get function URL or, or whatever it says there. And she's going to grab that function URL. So, so again, like here's, here's the pieces that we have. We have cog cognitive services that's running out there somewhere. We know that there's a list and a subscription key. We know that there's a graph. Uh, application with a client ID and client secret. And now we have a function URL that we're going to kind of use to complete the loop and create our webhook subscription. OK, so, so now that we've got our uh, Azure function, we're going to create the, the webhook subscription. We're going to abuse Graph Explorer a little bit for this. Graph Explorer, you've probably heard about. If you haven't, give it a try, even on your mobile device, aka MSGE. Um, but Graph Explorer is just a, it's like a streamlined HTTP request tool for issuing requests against Microsoft Graph. If you log into the tool, and we have logged in with Megan Bowen from a particular fictional domain tenant, then you can actually do write requests. I will advise you that these really are write requests. Whatever you do here is actually happening behind the scenes. Um, in our case, we're going to go ahead and create a subscription. But if we were to create a new mail here, then it would send that mail. Um, it's a great way to fiddle and, and try things in Microsoft Graph. So a uh, couple things we're, we're going to be posting to the subscriptions URL. Again, you cannot set this up to post unless you're logged in. Uh, the body has a couple things in it. The change type for us is going to be created. The URL that's going to get called back 
is that Azure function URL that we used. Um, the resource is going to be everything in her sent items folder. So if something gets created in Megan's sent items folder, uh, then we want the webhook to be triggered. And the expiration date time needs to be sometime within the next three days, so 72 hours from now. OK, so when we create that, we actually get a successful response back. And now we are fully up and running. We have our content moderator configured with its, with its list. We've got our Azure function running and listening. And we've got the, the webhook subscription created so that it will send out the notification as soon as we send an email. So let's go send an email. Um, so now we're logged into Outlook.com. Uh, we're logged in as Megan Bowen again, because that's who the demo's configured around. We're going to send an, an email to her friend, Patty, uh, and just use the words, hey, hi, guys, in the, in the email body. When this gets sent out, then Graph is going to, again, notice that email. It's going to fire the webhook. We'll be able to look at that in the Azure Function log and see that the webhook is being called. The Azure Function is going to call out to Microsoft Graph, get the body of the email. It's going to send the body of the email up to Cognitive Services and uh, evaluate it. It's going to find that it's not using not inclusive language in this particular case. And Megan is going to get a reply back that says, hey, here's some inclusivity tips that might work for you next time. So with that, we've kind of completed our full demo arc. Um, and uh, we can look at a couple things quickly in code here, but then we need to move back to the deck. Uh, so number one is uh, I want to look at the code that's necessary for the first time that the webhook gets created. It is important to have your Azure function running before you try to register the webhook subscription because the first thing that happens when you issue that request is Graph is going to send you a test webhook. And it will have a, a particular token in it that you need to grab and send back to Graph with a 200 OK response as a plain text response. So you're going to grab the validation token and then just round trip that back to Graph. So, so that is one thing to be aware of. Um, from there, then presumably any other invocation of this Azure function is going to be a real email that, that is getting sent. And so we're just kind of spooling off into code that uh, will we'll then go grab that email and send it up to, to Cognitive Services. Again, we'll post this code, and, um, and you'll see a link that you can use to get to the gist in just a second here. Um, so next steps for you guys. Number one, definitely go try Graph Explorer right away. Again, works on your mobile device, works on computers. Doesn't matter where you are. You don't need to be logged in to use it, but you can log in with either your corporate or consumer account. Again, what you do in Graph Explorer actually takes, so be careful. But AKAMS slash GE is an easy short link to get to Graph Explorer. Next, you can stop by the Microsoft Graph booth. It's kind of over in this direction, either you know tonight still or tomorrow. Uh, we've got 7 to 12 people there at all all points in time, and they can talk to you about any of the many, many APIs inside of Microsoft Graph. Third, you can brainstorm creative ideas. If you don't have a creative idea, well, then you can steal ours, and you can go build this into a real application. Um, again, the gist will be posted at akams slash incl for inclusive language. Um, then go build awesome apps and profit, hopefully. Uh, there are some other sessions that you should be aware of. Tomorrow, there are two more breakout sessions on Microsoft Graph. They are noted here. A bunch of theater sessions still to come tomorrow on Microsoft Graph. And of course, we love connecting with customers. Uh, our main places to connect are on Twitter with hashtag Microsoft Graph, on GitHub with the organization Microsoft Graph, uh, where you can actually contribute to Graph Explorer if you want to. Uh, and also on Stack Overflow, tag your questions with Microsoft Graph. With that, I thank you for your time. I will give you a whole whopping two minutes and change back. Uh, and if you have questions for me or Priya, please feel free to come up. Thank you.